God our Sovereign, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. It has been said that the only legitimate place for theology to begin is with this proposition. The world is not the way it should be. That was true for John the Baptist, and it is true for us today. The world is not as it should be. So if the world is not as it should be, then how should it be? What is the difference between the way of the world and the way of God? Or between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God? John Dominic Grossen, in his book, The Greatest Prayer, asks this question. What is the kingdom of God? When we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven, what is it that we are praying for? Just what is the kingdom of God on earth? Frozen answers the question in this way. When you read kingdom of God, mentally we phrase that as the ruling style of God. So when you read Kingdom of God, read it as the ruling style <coughs> of God. It imagines how the world would be if the biblical God actually sat upon an imperial throne down here on earth. It dreams of an earth where the Holy One of justice and righteousness actually gets to establish as we might say, the annual budget for the global economy. <coughs> the word economy comes from the Greek words oikos, meaning household, and nomos, meaning law. So economy, or oikonomos, means the law of the household. And the biblical writers envisioned this world as one great household with God as the head householder. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying that God's great and grand economic design for his household, the design of abundant blessings distributed in fairness for all people, would be modeled and practiced here on earth just as it is in heaven. And to that, Croson would add, don't worry about heaven. Heaven is doing quite well. It's earth that we have to worry about. Our concern is for the here and now, at this time and in this place, on earth, the prayer is your kingdom come on earth. Now we all have the potential to over-spiritualize the Bible and our faith so that they come, become disconnected from the real needs of the world around us. John the Baptist helps reconnect us with a warning about the sinfulness and the brokenness of this world. And if you paid attention to the gospel, you would see that Luke was very intentional, extremely intentional, about grounding John's message in a particular time and a particular place so that it would not be spiritualized. Listen again to how Luke sets up John's call for repentance. In the 15th year of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, 
and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis and Mycenaeus, ruler of Abilene, during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance, a baptism of change. That's what the word repent means, to turn around, to change, to go in a different direction. He went in the whole region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of change for the forgiveness of sins. Luke wants his readers to know that the reign of God is not some fantasy off in the future in another time and place. <clears throat> he links John's message specifically to geography and to history. He names both the religious and the political leaders of the day. They, after all, were the ones who were supposed to care for the welfare of the citizens of their territories. They were the ones who were to set the agenda for the earth. But then, as now, the world was not the way it should be. And so the Baptist looks at the world as he experienced it and was motivated to call for a change, to call for a transformation, to call for repentance, which would prepare the way for the coming of the one who would turn this world upside down. John also repeats the promise that God's salvation would be made known in the one who is to come, namely in Jesus. So following John, Jesus does come. He comes proclaiming the kingdom of God to be at hand. Jesus' message is that the kingdom is present among us. John said it was coming. Jesus said it is here. And yet, in spite of the proclamation of Jesus of the advent of the kingdom of God, the world continues to sit in darkness. It is still not the way it should be. Why? Could it be, now pay attention because this is the basis for your homework assignment. <laughs> Could it be that the world failed to see the difference between the world as it was and the world as it should be under the reign of God? <laughs> That's one possibility. They just simply didn't get the reign of God and couldn't fathom how it might be different from what was. Or here's the other possibility. That the world saw the difference between the two, but nevertheless chose for the status quo rather than for the transformation of the world. In other words, we like things just the way they are. Thank you, God. And what of us? We who have heard both the call to repentance from John and also the proclamation of Jesus of the presence of the reign of God among us, have we also failed to discern the difference or have we also perceived the difference, but have opted for the status quo? Maybe all of us need to take some time and to reflect upon how the world should be. What would it look like if God's kingdom 